At the start of the Joe Biden administration, the United States re-entered the Paris Climate Accord. Under the accord, nations agreed to limit emissions to reduce global warming this century to less than 2 degrees Celsius, compared to average global temperatures before the 19th century, a benchmark based on rising temperatures due to the Industrial Revolution. The agreement also has a secondary target of limiting warming to less than 1.5 degrees Celsius. To meet that goal, every nation signed to the accord is required to act, but every nation gets to set their own target. Last month, at the Earth Day Summit, President Joe Biden announced his administration's plan to cut the United States' greenhouse emissions by 50% by the year 2030. The U.S. is the second greatest contributor to climate change, behind only China. Any action on climate change at all was a welcome change of pace after the previous administration backed out of the Paris Climate Accord altogether. The administration's plan includes $174 billion for electric vehicles and charging stations to help shift consumers away from gas vehicles, $100 billion to update the electric grid to prevent catastrophes like the Texas blackout, $10 billion for a civilian climate core to restore land, and more. Biden is including this climate change action as part of a larger American jobs plan, selling it to the people of the United States based on the jobs it will presumably create, instead of the goal of combating an existential threat to the planet. While the plan is a step in the right direction, it is actually a fairly small step. Experts are already sounding the alarm that this will not be enough to combat climate change and that the real goal for 2030 should be closer to 70%. Furthermore, there is no guarantee that the U.S. will stay true to this commitment or see it through all the way to 2030. The previous goal made under President Barack Obama was aimed at 2025. If the U.S. met its previous commitment, it would be on track to reduce emissions by only 38% by 2030, but it is not. Worse still, the idea that this will inspire other nations to take action may be a fantasy. Remember, the Paris Climate Accord allows each nation to set their climate change goal however they choose, and even if they take a cue from the United States, they too will only pass half measures such as this. Worst of all, there is no reason to expect other nations to take the lead. Most nations missed the 2020 United Nations deadline to strengthen their 2030 climate goals. The Biden administration's climate change proposal is a better-than-nothing mishmash of ideas that moderately addresses the problem while still prioritizing corporate interests. It will be met with mild, unenthusiastic approval from some experts based exclusively on the opposing party's plan of doing even less, but will nonetheless be declared radical by said opposing party. In other words, it's a Democrat plan. Right-wing news media, such as Fox News, cannot attack the American Jobs Plan based on how ineffective it will be in combating climate change because their rhetoric relies on either pretending climate change does not exist and does not need to be combated in the first place, or paying lip service to the fact that it does exist but still downplaying the danger. Therefore, right-wing news media must attack the American Jobs Plan either by claiming that it will negatively affect jobs or through some barely disguised lie to throw their audiences off track. The former is more challenging because the Jobs Plan has, you know, jobs. Lots of construction jobs that will pay a reasonable wage and will sit well with middle America. Thus, right-wing media went with the latter a meaningless, dishonest culture war about hamburgers. The right-wing talking point came from the Daily Mail in the United Kingdom, a fish wrap tabloid with low credibility on its best days. The Daily Mail cited a University of Michigan study and claimed that a push for lower emissions would result in a mandate for limitations in meat consumption. That is not actually what the study said, though. The researchers behind the study have even gone on record stating the Daily Mail's interpretation of their data is erroneous. Nevertheless, the misinformation spread, and here is how. On April 23rd, the day after the Daily Mail article, America Reports with John Roberts and Sandra Smith took bits and pieces from that article and molded them into a narrative for the early afternoon audience of Fox News. 
Not long after America Reports butchered the story, the evening hosts served it up. Sean Hannity tried to stay relevant in the shadow of Tucker Carlson by running with this story. Janine something or other made a big deal out of it too. She does not matter. The point is, the Daily Mail listed some out-of-nowhere hypotheticals like burger rationing, and Fox News ran with it as if it were an actual proposal. They created a narrative. Biden is out to steal your hamburgers. He's the Hamburglar. By Monday, one Fox News anchor walked it back in a segment that lasted all of 20 seconds, but the damage had been done. By that point, Republican politicians had already pounced and made it part of their agenda. So why hamburgers? Fox News and eventually right-wing politicians chose burgers because of the patriotic connotation. Burgers are simple American food that Americans eat. We are the land of the free, home of the Whopper. For example, it wouldn't work if it were a culture war about the filet mignon. A filet mignon is an expensive food for East Coast elites. Plus, it has a French name. One freedom steak, please. It had to be burgers because of what burgers make Americans think about. America itself. By positioning Biden as anti-burger, it follows that he is un-American. Now, let's zoom out a bit. You didn't think this whole video was going to be about burgers, right? We are only a few months into the Biden administration, and we are already beginning to see the emerging media narratives that will populate cable news for at least the next four years. Right-wing media will invent or exaggerate problems with the Biden administration. Mainstream media will debunk this. The audience of right-wing media will not read the debunking because the debunking is the real fake news to them. Liberal anchors and commentators, because they feel defensive due to all the misinformation, will cover for the Biden administration, defending Biden from criticism from the right and ignoring criticism from the left. For anyone who is late to class, liberal is not left-wing. Liberalism is, at best, a centrist political ideology. There is precious little left-wing media in the United States, confined largely to alternative newspapers and zines that nobody reads, Democracy Now!, and popular online personalities. Biden will be criticized by the left on social media, but he will not be criticized by the left on cable news. Maybe here and there when CNN interviews Cornell West, but left-wing criticism will not come from the anchors and will not be endorsed by the cable news channels. The most left-leaning host on MSNBC is maybe Lawrence O'Donnell, who is at most a social democrat and he does not have one of the good time slots like Chris Hayes or Rachel Maddow. There is right-wing criticism of liberal politicians on cable news. There is liberal defense of liberal politicians on cable news. But there is no consistent left-wing criticism anywhere. The reason for this is obvious. It is not in the interest of media conglomerates to advocate socialism or even social democracy. This exclusion of left-wing criticism in mainstream news media has some unfortunate consequences. Because there is no widely seen left-wing criticism of a liberal president, any left-wing criticism against that president will be mistakenly seen as grouped together in the same category as right-wing criticism. Every time there's a left-wing or just legitimate criticism of Biden, some liberal derails the conversation with better than Trump though. Yeah, I know that. Anyone is better than Trump. That is not in dispute. And that is not the point. See, because right-wing criticism of a liberal president is often so ridiculous, liberals can more easily dismiss left-wing criticism because they are so accustomed to criticism against their president being bullsh**. It creates a false notion of who the president is. For example, Fox News spent every waking hour during the Barack Obama administration manufacturing absurd lies and making mountains out of various molehills. During one press conference, President Obama wore a tan suit, and Fox News claimed it was not presidential, and even confirms he's a Marxist. Another time, Obama asked for a Dijon mustard, and Fox News claimed this made Obama an elitist. 
This is similar to the Biden burger fiasco. There is nothing elitist about a mustard that is brown instead of yellow, but Americans associate ordinary yellow mustard with their plain talking American identity. This created a narrative in right-wing media, but it also created a narrative in media in general. The notion that Obama's scandals are all made up goofy nonsense like the tan suit. We see it all the time. Whenever Donald Trump landed himself in yet another scandal, the news media would respond with headlines like, At this point in his presidency, Obama's biggest scandal was using Dijon mustard. Among Obama's liberal supporters, the common narrative is that the Obama administration was largely without scandal and was innocent and harmless, that he was the best president we have ever had and subject to only the mildest criticism. Right-wing media uses these culture wars to rile up their base, and liberals use these culture wars as evidence that their side is without sin. Obama's biggest scandal was only a tan suit, lol. In reality, the Obama administration ramped up drone strikes, expanded the war on terror into new territories, and is responsible for untold civilian deaths. No, it was not for some greater good. No, it was not to spread freedom. No, it was not to liberate nations. The goals were the same as they were for the presidents who preceded him, to advance United States global hegemony and economic interests. The Obama administration also gave a greater mandate to ICE, which resulted in mass deportations, far exceeding those in the George W. Bush administration. If this does not sound familiar, here is why. Right-wing cable news media ignored all of this during the Obama administration because they approved of the war on terror and anti-immigration policies. They would have had to praise the Obama administration, and they can't do that. Liberal news media rarely criticized Obama for these actions. It would not have fit within their ideology to do so. And now, under the Biden administration, we are seeing the same thing. Biden is already bombing Syria, and there has been very little pushback because the right wing loves it, liberal media does not care enough, and left wing media barely exists. Biden's relationship with the media will almost certainly be this way for the next four years. Absolute garbage stories and made up nonsense from Fox News, denial from MSNBC and CNN because they have more facts on their side and no significant legitimate criticism of the President of the United States or our place in global politics. Burger accusations and burger denials to distract the people from what is really going on.